All right. Good morning, church family. Good morning. We had just an amazing worship as we sang together as a singing church and praising God together. And I just love that. So before we get started, let's just uh, uh, let's ask God to be a part of this conversation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this day. We ask your help to navigate through this conversation. I pray, Father God, that we would not put our arms crossed and put our fingers in our spiritual ears. And I pray, Father God, that we would hear you with fresh ears, with a fresh heart, willing to walk out of here and living it out. So, Father, as we close out the book of James, we pray, Father God, as we look back, we would see all of the wisdom, all of the reminders and the warnings of how not to live. But as we move forward, Lord God, we pray, Father God, that we would be active in following you closer and closer. So we thank you, Father God, in what you're about to do. In ways, Father God, that I cannot do, but only you can speak to our hearts. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity that you would just, that we would be uh, people that would hear you. And not only hear you, but live out what you tell us. It is in Christ's name we pray and we all said... Amen. I am so excited to close out the book of James. As we all know, the book of James is hard for many of us that we understand that. There was a pastor that said that there was a congregant that came up to him after they did the book of James. And, the, and this congregant came up to the pastor and said to him, Pastor, I am so loving the book of James. But at the same time, I, I am also challenged by the book of James. And I am so glad the book of James only has five chapters. Because if we're to be real about what we've been going through in the book of James, it's actually challenging. The book of James will turn your world upside down in a way that, you should, that we should all understand that if we live just, a, 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 just a, a common Christian life, that's not what James is trying to tell us in the book of James. One of the things that I said when we talked about the book of James that it hurts so good because there's areas that we, I don't know about you, in this book of James, there may have been a lot of bruised arms and bruised ribs. Simply because you heard something and you're like, that's you. That's you. Did, did you guys catch that even in that, in, in many of the messages? Even with Pastor, um, Pastor Edgar where he was talking about the tongue. And how it's, how it's just a deadly poison, right? It's easy to look at the book of James and just elbow your neighbor instead of yourself. What I love about the book of James is it does good for God's people. And it also does good for the glory of God. You see, the book of James should be something that we would always revisit. To remind us. Are we living a, a Christian life based on what we want or what God wants? And I think that's a reminder. But today we're going to end the book of James. And some of you guys, whoo. But we're going to go into a new series called Ecclesiastes. Which is kind of funny. The book of James is kind of giving us wisdom to not live foolishly. Right? But at the same time in the book of Ecclesiastes... Solomon was given wisdom but acted foolishly. So this is a great transition out of the book of James into a life of how to live a wise life with Christ. And at the same time, removing ourselves from acting foolishly. So what I want to do today is I want to give us the big idea for today. That helps framework our conversation. And our big idea today is this. Do life with eternity in mind. Do life with eternity in mind. One of the big things here at Not Avenue Christian Church is life groups, community, doing life together. Because there's value in doing life together. There's a reminder when we are in community, it is hard for us to kind of wander away. But if we are in community and somebody decides to wander away, guess what? The people in your community will start to reach out to you and say, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. There is value in doing life together. Why? When we do life together in community, we know how to do life in community. Where we live, where we work, where we go to school, where we tread our feet, anywhere we go. 
we would learn how to do community in light of eternity. You see, we just can't live this Christian life in such a way that we don't think of the eternal purpose. That we just can't just sit here and just be okay with our Christian life. That we just do this holy, holy huddle and then go out there and don't live it out. And what I want to do in this, in, this, um, in this conversation is that typically what we do is that we read it all the way through. And then we go back up and we start to break it down. What I want to do today is I want to uh, give you four points as we walk through this last part of the book of James. And the four, the four points are in, in a way of four Ps. All right. And our first point is this, patience. If you're writing notes, patience. So what we're going to do is we're going to read uh, verses 7 to 11 in chapter 5. And we're going to break it down and then we're going to move on to the next P's and the other P's, all right? So follow along. In, in uh, James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11, it says this. Be patient. Therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Be patient about it until it receives the early and late rain. You also be patient. Establish your heart for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those, who, those blessed who remain steadfast. You, are, you have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Did you see the, the reoccurring theme in this first half? In this first part is patience. You see, we live in a society where patience is hard. Can I get a witness? Amen? Patience is hard. It is not natural. And I can almost feel the elbows all the way from where my, my family is sitting. Albert, you are not a patient person. And that's what we do. We're, we're, we're not a patient people. We're a more of a microwave, instant kind of people. We want our, our desires met now. Amen? You know, in society, they have created so many things that are instant. Instagram, right? You want your social media or your Snapchat that it could be right then and there. And even in our foods, right? They have instant breakfast. They have instant lunch. They have instant dinner so you can cook it in your Instapot. But yet we still have to wait. Amen? You're like, I thought you were instant pot. Why do you have to wait for like an hour and 45 minutes? I might as well go back to my crock pot. Because the instant pot is a crock. I'm just making it, just messing with you guys. But I love what, I, what, what this is trying to show us. Is this is not natural. It has to be supernatural. What I love about this part of, the, of this book, because last week Mike was talking about that, the, the, that James was not actually talking to the church, but people outside of the church because of their greediness and what their riches were doing to them. Now James is now turning back to his church family. It's almost like James is turning back to his church family or his community or his life group to do life and to remind them there is value in doing life because we get to encourage one another when it comes to patience. When it comes to these things, there are some of you guys in this room that have the gift of patience. I wish I can have some of, a little sprinkle of that. My family also wishes I had a little sprinkle of that. And if you do, meet me outside and let me know how, how that all works out. But I know you're going to tell me it's Jesus. Amen? And I believe this is. Because he starts out in verse 7, he says, be patient therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer awaits. Uh, waits. For the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rain. You also be patient, establish your heart for the coming of the Lord is at hand. What's interesting about this is that James uses the example of a farmer. I don't know about you, any, any farmers in here? I am not a farmer. Because it takes a lot of patience, right? And what's interesting about the farmer here is that it talks about that he has to be patient for the early and late rains. In other words... The farmers know the seasons of when the rain would come. 
It would come in October in the spring, I mean in the fall, and it would come in October and November, and in March and April in the spring. But in between, we think that the farmer just kind of just sits around and puts his hand behind his head and thinks, okay, I'm just going to wait for the rain. This is not what it's talking about. Being patient is just not sitting there and waiting for God to do his work. Being patient is still doing what we can in the middle of waiting for God. You see, a lot of times what we do is that we wait for Jesus. And one of the things that it's, it's also saying is that the Lord is at hand. And in other words, what James is trying to say is that there is a second coming. Jesus will come back for his church. But while you are a follower of Jesus, don't wait at the bus stop waiting for Jesus to take you home. In your waiting, what are you doing? In your waiting, are you doing the Great Commission? Telling everybody about Jesus. Making disciples. Baptizing. Teaching. Living this out. This is what we do when we wait in patience for the Lord. We can't just sit idly. And that's what not what a farmer is supposed to do. A farmer in the middle of the rains is still taking up the weeds, still plowing the fields, making it ready for the rain. And at the same time, church family, are we ready when Jesus comes back for his church? And the reason why he starts out with this is because there is a, there is a, a feeling that many people just live in just waiting and thinking, oh, Jesus is not going to come back till later. But what I love what it says right here, it says that, that he, he says that he, the judge is standing at the, I'm sorry, that for the coming of the Lord is at hand. It's closer than we think. The Bible says that Jesus will come back as a thief in the night. I don't know about you. A thief never knocked on your door and says, I will be back tomorrow to take everything you got. Right? The thief will come as a thief in the night. Are you ready? I'm thinking about the parable of, of the ten uh, virgins. That five of them was ready while the other five was just kind of like, oh, don't worry. We'll get ready when we get, when we get ready. And then when, the, when the, the trumpet sound, the five went in and the door closed and another five came in thinking, oh, can you let me in? And he says, nope, too late. Church family, let's not be a people that waits and procrastinates to actually live out this faith in a genuine fashion. You see, what James is trying to do here is trying to cause our faith to last. He's also trying to make us as believers encourage one another to make it to the end, that our faith finishes. The other part of this is that he also says while we're waiting, he says in verse 9, he says, do not grumble against one another, brother, and so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. What is he saying there? He's saying be patient with people. Oh, man. Now you got to put people in the mix. People make me impatient. For those who drive, the person that you be like, hurry up, hurry up. And you go around that person, you give them the death stare. You should not be driving, you should be walking. Get off the road. Or the person that, that goes in, the, in that, in that uh, express lane. Let's be honest. How many of you guys are counters when it says 15 items of less? Oh, why they in that line? It's express. What are you doing? Right? And it's true. The thing about it is that this takes supernatural, a supernatural God to give us this kind of patience for people. You see, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, part of the spirit that God gives the believer and the fruits of that is patience. So some of you guys are probably thinking, well, I don't have patience. Well, if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus gives us patience. All we have to do is try to receive it and to live this out. 1 Corinthians chap chapter 13, we all know that this is for a lot of those that got married. And this is, was the, ver the chapter that was read at your marriage. This is not a marriage verse. You got to remember, the book of Corinthians was a, a church that was in chaos. 
And they were infighting in the church. They were doing all kinds of crazy things. And Paul decides, I'm going to write this chapter 13 to remind the church, love is this way. And he says, love is patient. Part of loving each other and people in their own, you know, weird ways, we got to show patience. Because that's what love is. We're also reminded in Ephesians 4, 2 and 3, it says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit. Binding yourself together with peace. This passage is for us as believers. That there should be unity between us as believers. There, if, if there's one thing the enemy wants to do, he would love to cause a wedge in our relationship and our church. And he would use that wedge to cause a big chasm and a breakup. Many churches are breaking up simply because there has been a wedge broken into the foundation of his church. As believers, we should always seek. It says make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit. And if you have any fault against anybody here or any brother or sister in Christ... We need to go pursue that and make every effort to make things right. Even if you feel like you have a percentage, a small percentage of that fight. God has called us to be that people of peace. Also in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 to 15, it says, be patient with everyone. See that no one pays, e pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. In other words, we need to be patient with everyone. I was at the grocery store the other day. And there was a situation that happened right when I was about to pay. And there was a lady that was there that was bagging up my stuff while there was another co-worker of hers that says, hey, um, I'm off a break, so this is my station. And the girl, they started fighting like, no, no, I'm here, don't worry, and all this. And, and the girl kind of like looked at her and like rolled her eyes like, wow. After this girl left and moved to a different station, the, new, the girl that was kind of felt disrespected kind of looked at her and be like, you know what? It's just been a tough day. She wasn't talking to me. She was talking to the, ca the cashier lady. And she was like, this has just been a tough day. A, 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 a customer just got on me and now she got on me. He goes, watch. The next person, the next person, you're going to see me while out. I was like, all right. And then after that, I just remember after she bagged up my stuff, she looked at me and she goes, have a good day. And I looked at her, I go, no, you have a better day. As I was leaving, she ended up leaving that section. She went outside to go uh, move some carts or get the carts and stuff like that. I pulled up next to her and I said, hey, I just want to just say to you, great job on being patient. It was unnatural uh, to have patience. She goes, oh, yeah, you, uh, I know what you're talking about. But I said, good job that you showed patience. And I hope that encouraged her to be reminded that that's not natural. But she held it well for a customer. I was like, that's pretty cool. But also in that passage, it also talks about a different kind of patience. It talks about being steadfast. In verse 11, it says, behold, we consider those who, who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord. How the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Here's the, here's the other way of thinking about being patient. Is being steadfast. In other words, this patience is for when we go through stuff. When we go through trials. When we go through things that we, we just be like, God, where are you? Where, where have you been? If we, and I love what he used in this, and he says that he uses the example of Job. How many of you guys know uh, about the story of Job and how he had a steadfastness? 42 chapters in the book of Job, and you see the faithfulness throughout. But there are some times in Job's, in this 42 chapters, that there's these times in Job that you realize, man, is Job going to turn away? Here's what happened on the very first chapter, the very first chapter in the book of Job. Pretty much this first day in Job's life that he just woke up thinking everything would be the same. And, and Satan goes in front of God and tells God, God, this guy is going to follow you because you have blessed him. Let me, let me cause chaos in what you have blessed him with. And on the first day, this is what happened. 
500 oxen and 500 donkeys were stolen from Job. And as this guy, as a servant came and tell, told Job, right when he was done, another servant came out and says, hey, 700 of your sheep has just been burned up. Fire from heaven came down and just burned up all your sheep. And then after that, just when he got done telling him, 3,000 3, camels was stolen from him. And right when he was done telling that, this for a lot of us would take the cake. Job's sons and daughters were just eating together and having, having a, a time of eating with one another. And then a freak accident happened and then they all died. And you're probably thinking, I'm like, wow, that's some steadfastness. And in the very next chapter, I don't know if it was the next day, but if it was the next day, it's like, whoa, this is a lot of stuff. Job gets these painful boils from his head to his toe. I don't know if he ever had boil. A boil before, they're no joke. It's like an over super duper pimple that hurts. I'm not going to tell you where I had it at. <laughs> and then while he's going through this pain, his wife comes up and says, curse God and die. But this is Job's heart. In verse 2, uh, in chapter 2, verse 9, it says, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. But it took 42 chapters for the purpose of, the, of suffering in Job's life to be revealed. In the very last chapter, in verses 5 to 6, it says, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. You see, Job, as he was going through it, and many of us go through a lot of things. And if you look at Job's life, and there are some of us here today that you just feel like you just can't get a break. You feel like when the rain pour, when, when, the, when the rain comes, it pours. Amen? And you kind of just feel like, man, God, when is this going to end? When is this season going to end? But God wants to show us purpose. He wants to show us that even in our, in our toughest season, he wants to show his mercy and his compassion. And he wants to always show his purpose. And a lot of times we only see the tree that is in front of us, but we could not see the forest. Because we always look at the circumstance and that does not move away. And we're always kind of saying, God, where are you? I cannot see. And we don't want the blindness of God. We want to have our eyes open to see God and what he wants to use us in our situation. And I know there are many stories that I know personally here. That some of you have gone through a lot of stuff. But what you have said, whether on social media or in person, you're always saying, my faith is in God. That's the faithfulness and the steadfastness that Job had. And I know it's not joyful in these moments. But we have to understand that. But at the same time, we have to be reminded, even in our toughest times, God has a purpose for us. And number two, if you're writing your notes, is the promise. In verse 12 it says this, but above all my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. The context here is this, is that we want our, what we say to be real. Many times we have a lot of people try to make us promises and say a lot of things. But we never see in their life that it is fulfilled in their life. One of the things that they did in this time was that they said that if don't swear by God or his throne, that is a no-no. But you can swear by anything on earth and it's kind of good. It's almost like a white lie. We do this all the time. We validate by making these promises to people just so they can say Think that we're telling the truth. We always, we always do this by earthly standards. This is what we do. I'm telling you the truth. It's on my mama. How many of you guys ever heard that before? It's on my daddy. It's on my, it's on my sons and my daughters. It's on my kids. And if you're a gang member or an old gang member like me, it's on my dead homies. You're probably thinking, that's weird. Yeah, it is weird not to think about it. But that's exactly what we do. We do that all the time just to validate, uh, to let people know, hey, I'm not telling a lie. But it says here, if you're going to make a promise, let it be real. Let it be reliable. And at the same time, in, in our, in, when we do life together, we encourage one another that, hey, we're believers. 
We shouldn't be acting this way. Let's continue the promise that we made with God that we would follow him and be led by him. Let's be real about our faith in Jesus. That we have to understand that we made a promise. And the promise needs to be kept. And once again, going back to that last part of being patient is that it says that the Lord is at hand, that he would be coming back. And that promise that when we stand before God, would, uh, the only way that Jesus would say, come in my faithful servant, the only way that would happen is if he sees the promise in your life. And the promise of Jesus in your life. But if, but if he does not see Jesus in your life, what does he say? I never knew you. So church family, we've got to keep that promise. Because eternity is at stake. Where are you going to spend eternity if you don't keep the promise that you made with God? And the next one is prayer. If you're taking notes, prayer. Verses 13 to 17, it says this. If any of you among you is suffering, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful, let him sing songs, sings praise. Is any among you, anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sin, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with, with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that he might not, that it may not rain. For the for three years and six months, it did not rain on earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. You see, in this, in this passage of prayer, sometimes we take prayer as it is, God, you need to heal, because that's who you are. As opposed to, it is your will, God, and I will trust in it. You see, in this first part where it says, if any among you is suffering, let him pray. If anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise. In other words, no matter if it is good or bad, keep praying and keep praising. Amen? Many times we, we go to God in praise and prayer only when, it, when it, the days are hard. But sometimes when the days are really, really good and things are just happening, we almost lose our praise and pray, our prayer and praise to Jesus. Amen? So no matter if it's good or bad, we need prayer and we need to pray. And the other one is this. If anyone among you is sick, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them uh, pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. You see, many times you probably have done somebody do the anointing of oil on you just as they're praying, whether it be sick. One of the things that we, we have to understand is this. It's not... For only the elders. This, this is kind of like what we, we kind of look in these passages and we try to think this is the, the structure of what we need to do when we are going through stuff. Is that we call the elders of the church. In other words, this is exactly what the elders, what they would do. If somebody was bedridden, they would call the, the faithful brothers in the church the, or the faithful leaders of the church to go over and be mobile so they can pray over those who are bedridden or at home that could not come to the church to get prayed over. And also when we think about the oil, we think that the oil is something that is very powerful or, or anointing with oil is something. But it is something. You know, a lot of times when we think with oil in this time, what they're thinking is oil was medicinal. That the oil will cause some kind of healing. Almost like for a lot of you guys, if you're in here that are Filipino, Vicks. We think Vicks is that healing property. Or sometimes they thought it was sacramental. In, a, in other words, that if you get anointed with oil, it would cause sin to be removed from your life. That's not what this is. I believe this is symbolic. Because when anytime you think about oil being poured over or, or put on somebody, it was to set them apart for God's purpose. They would anoint priests and they would anoint prophets. They would anoint kings to be set apart for God's purpose. And this oil is to do that while we are going through our sickness, whatever it may be. Is that God would be used and magnified through our sickness to show and to tell everybody that I am set apart. No matter if I get healed or not, I am going to serve the Lord. Amen. 
And some of us were probably thinking, oh, man, I, don't, I like the healing part, Albert. I bet you Paul would love that too. He asked three times for the thorn in the flesh to be removed from him. And what, what did God say to him? My grace is sufficient. You're like, thanks, God. That's cheerful. Then he says this, but my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And sometimes that's all God needs to give us. And it's a reminder that we need to be set apart in our prayer. I mean, when we get anointed with that oil. Not only that, it says this. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. In other words, guys, we need to be a praying church. We need to be a praying church to the point that we can confess our faults to one another. That's part of being doing life together and being part of community is saying to one another, hey, I need help. And that's why we are big about doing life together, big about doing community and doing life groups together. Why? Because when we struggle in this life, we can confess to one another and say, man, I need help. I need healing. And you know what it says right here? It says that, that the prayer of faith, in verse 15, it says the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And this word sick is not necessarily that kind of sick that we get <coughs> and sniffles and all that. This is the kind of sick of this, is that I'm just sick and tired. For those who have addiction, I'm just sick and tired of being an alcoholic. I'm just sick and tired of being, using drugs. I'm sick and tired of just the anxiety in my life. Why does he say that? He says that the, the, that the Lord will raise them up. That when we pray for one another, a prayer of faith, we would ask God, God, I'm sick and tired of these things in my life and I need your help. I know there's some of us that we're going through some stuff, some habits or some things that we've been struggling with and we're just sick and tired. And God wants to raise you up. He wants to lift you up. But you got to go to somebody so they can pray the prayer of faith over you to remind you that your faith should last. Your faith should be strong. Your faith goes from faith to faith. And then after that, it says that we should confess to one another. I was thinking about this uh, allergy commercial. This allergy commercial kind of put icons over each person that was at the park. While this guy was walking a the dog, there was an icon, dog allergy. While this person was sitting on the grass, grass allergy. While this person was sitting next to the, the flowers, pollen allergies. And these icons are to show this allergy commercial, to show them that this, this medicine can help them when they struggle through these allergies. And the same way, when we struggle, guys, and nobody knows the icons in your life that you are struggling, nobody can pray the prayer of faith over you. But when we confess to one another and say, this is what I'm going through, and then the next time they see you, they walk up to you and go, Albert, the prayer that, you, you, that, that, that prayer request that you gave me last week, How's everything going? And I could either say, man, praise God, God came through. Or, I'm still going through it. But let's continue to pray. See, we should be a praying church. We should do life in light of eternity. So our faith does not fail, but our faith finishes. And the last one is this. Is the, is the last P. It's pursuit. I want to add a P. A, but let's just put it this way. Number four is passionate pursuit. Verse 19, it says, my brothers, if any, anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. When we do life together... When we are in life group together, when we're in community with one another, we start to know who has been missing. And our passionate pursuit as believers, as people in the community, as family members of God, we start to realize, I have not seen this couple. I have not seen this person in a while. Now my passionate pursuit is, I'm going to give them a call. I messaged somebody not, uh, this past week. Simply because they put something on social media and I just kind of text, kind of messaged them privately and said, hey... I haven't seen you in a while. Are you not coming here anymore? Are you going to a different church? And this, this uh, brother said, yes, we're actually going to a different church. And to you and I, you're probably thinking, man, that must have hurt you, Albert, because they're no longer coming and not having. No. You know what hurts me? 
If somebody leaves this church and goes to nothing, that hurts me. But if somebody leaves this family to go to family, praise God. Grow where you're planted. Amen? That's a praise. At least I'm reassured. The clarification of, the, of, of my assumption was, are they going somewhere? Now that I know they are, I'm praising God. Thank you, Jesus. But there is somebody that you know that has been wandering. People that are walking away from the faith. Guys, we need to be passionate in that pursuit to bring them back. To pray for them. To call them and invite them. Or even have dinner and say, man, I haven't seen you in a while. Is there anything I can pray for? And I think that's what we do when we do life. When we do life with eternity in mind. That we desire people to come back. Amen. Amen. I just want to encourage you. If you're here today and you realize, man, I don't have that community. Sign up. We're kicking off all of our life groups. We're kicking off all of our community groups that we can come together and pray for one another. That we would come together and encourage each other for in patience of waiting for the Lord. That we don't sit idly. That we would, we would remind each other in our life groups that we need a, we, we, we set a promise to God. Let's keep it. Let's encourage one another to keep the promise that we are followers of Jesus. Also in, 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 our, in, our, in our do life, in our, in our groups, we encourage each other through prayer. Because we know that God can only do what God can do. We can only just summon God and say, God, my brother and my sister in Christ is going through a struggle. We need your help. And we can find comfort in prayer. The prayer of faith. And at the same time, in community, and when we do community, when we do life, we have a heart to pursue after those who have started to wander. We sing that song, we're prone to wander. So church family, let's just be a people that desires to do life, to do community, to remind ourselves how important this community is so when we go, live, go out there, we know how to live amongst the community. Amen. So one of the things I do want to do is this. It's simply to invite you for any opportunities to do life. On the screen is an opportunity as you walk out of this place. You'll see these umbrellas. You can sign up for your next steps in your next step card. If you desire to be involved and be a part. Go and be a part of life. You can fill out that card and give it to somebody. And they would surely this week reach out to you and, rem and, sh and let you know that we have opportunities for you to do life. Another opportunity to do life is, uh, I'm sorry, another opportunity is also to do life. If we see our image on the board. Another opportunity, if you're a young adult, if you know any young adults, another opportunity to do life is that we have a young adult, a young adult conference I want to invite you to. Not only that, we have another uh, opportunity is this Wednesday is our block party. This is where we come all together, all church to come together and, and uh, show each other that anybody that comes here that our life groups are here and we're ready to roll and we're ready to, to do life together. And this is an opportunity for you and I to, to come alongside anybody that uh, is, is uh, kind of like not in life group. But there's also a challenge in this block party, I just want to say. Pastor Joe challenged me in a ping pong tournament one game on this day. Whoever wins, if, if I win, Joe has to shave his beard. If he wins, I just get to shave my mustache. Woo! A great opportunity to come to our block party. But let me just pray for us. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for today. We ask, Father, that you would help us to navigate through our Christian walk. Help us to understand Doing life in community is very valuable in the life of a believer. We see that sometimes we get impatient. We sometimes feel like, God, where are you? Where have you been? And then when we're in community, when we're in, in life groups, we're surrounded by people that would care for us, that would pray for us, and remind us of the promise that we have made a promise to you. 
And at the same time that we would be uh, reminded that we need to also have a passionate pursuit for those who have been wandering away. But if there's somebody in this room today that has not made a commitment to God, that hasn't started their due life with you, I want to invite you. Today is a great opportunity, especially in the community that you are surrounded in, this church family that you are surrounded in. I pray, Father, that you would encourage their heart for them to make a decision to do life with you. And if you're here today, simply just say, God, I realize I've been living my life aimlessly apart from you. And everywhere I feel like I'm getting to a certain goal in my life, it just feels like it never satisfies. But today, Lord, I choose life, a life with you. And I ask you to come into my life Surrounding me with people that would encourage me. And from this day forward, I promise to do life with you. It's in Christ's name we pray and we all said amen. And if any of you guys made that decision today, once again, that next step card is also an opportunity to let us know that you made a decision for Christ. So church family, continue to be reminded, let's do life together. Why don't we all stand up and let's worship together.